Go ahead, Susan. Sorry, it's taking a little bit longer than it normally does. We'll get there. This should work. Give me a thumbs up if everybody hears and sees that. Thank you. We just hear you. We don't hear the video. Right. We can see the video, but we can't hear it. Thank you. sea levels are on the rise. By the end of this century, hundreds of millions of people, more than the current population of the United States, could be displaced from their homes. In the Indian Ocean, in the South Pacific, and in the Caribbean, entire countries are under threat. Great Decisions investigates what can be done to prepare for the climate crisis on the horizon. Rising Tide climate change and the world's oceans. Next on Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association in association with Thomson Reuters. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by PricewaterhouseCoopers LLP and the Nelson B. Delavan Foundation. The iconic images of global climate change show the retreat of glaciers and the melting of the polar ice caps. But the reasons for sea level rise are diverse and complex. There are two major factors that contribute to rising sea levels. One is simply that warmer water takes up more volume. The second biggie is ice melting off land. There's a whole array of projections for the end of the century, but some of them go up to as much as two meters. Uh, the most optimistic projections are only one meter. Another major unknown is the rate at which the West Antarctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet will melt. The climate is changing. It's clear that human activity is playing a role. I think some of the projections of catastrophic warming aren't born in the data. They're based on scenarios that are unlikely to become true. In that regard, yes, we can talk about climate change and the costs and the benefits of a warming world, but at the same time, the, the fear mongering um, is almost just as disingenuous as saying global warming is a hoax. Climate change is real and it's caused by human behavior. Our use of fossil fuels uh, and carbon emissions is adding to the warming of the earth. The gradual rise in temperatures and sea levels are closely linked to the severity of extreme weather. The hey everyone, I apologize. Um, my computer's behaving a little bit differently than it normally does. Give me just a moment.
try this one more time. I think this should do it and enjoy. Accumulation of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere poses a global problem, which no one country can address alone. The Nobel laureate Bill Nordhaus has put forward some helpful figures. What he's identified is very clearly is that we've, we've moved from a situation where temperatures have risen significantly more in the last few centuries than they did for the last 650,000 years. So the implication is that if we reduce or pivot some of these human-led activities, that you would therefore see a reduction in emissions and therefore you would see at least a reduction in the degree to which the temperature around the world is actually rising. We know to achieve the ultimate goal of certainly keeping warming below two degrees centigrade, uh, that that's going to require upping the ante uh, beyond that 10 or 15 year time period. We're talking about certainly the industrialized countries like the United States looking at 80% kinds of reductions by mid-century. It's the consensus of the models in this area that a two degree target is at this point getting very, very difficult to meet, even with maximum efforts. Some of the modeling that's been done in this area would suggest carbon taxes in the 500 to 1,000 or even higher dollars per ton of CO2. Even if the United States were to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions down to zero or achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions, the climate models project that we would only mitigate global temperatures a few tenths of a degree Celsius by the year 2100, and we would maybe avert a few centimeters of sea level rise over that same time period. The Paris Agreement, negotiated by 196 countries in 2015, was intended to provide a framework for more ambitious global emissions reduction targets. In 2017, President Donald Trump announced the United States' intention to withdraw from the accord. What I think this administration saw is that the Paris Accord would have significant costs to the American economy in terms of the policies that would increase the cost of energy and drive out attempts to produce coal, oil, and natural gas in the United States and shift those activities elsewhere. One country by itself will make essentially no difference to whether it's sea level rise or other impacts of climate change because they're only a small fraction of the emissions. So what's really damaging about the Trump policies is that it slows this very difficult process of reaching international consensus and after that an international agreement. It would be nice to have a Paris Accord, but one that holds all the countries equally responsible. My problems with Kyoto and Paris weren't the goals. The goals are great. The problem is that, that they kind of cut Russia and China a break, which I don't think is totally fair to the developed nations like the United States and Europe. The United States got all of the benefits of our polluting days as we rose to an industrial giant. And now we're in the position of telling countries like China and India that they should forsake that benefit that the United States got, unregulated carbon pollution, simply because the crisis is here and now. The rationale for the withdrawal from the accord remains hotly debated in Washington. What disturbs me about it is that I think he's done it mainly to placate the coal producing constituency here in the United States. More specifically, he's concerned about the states of West Virginia and Kentucky. And uh, I think that's an unfortunate way to make these kinds of decisions. I was in the White House Situation Room on the day after the withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord happened. I take it as basically a box checking exercise that was something that wasn't done with a lot of regard for the long-term consequences of future generations of our country or the planet. Domestic politics. There's no rational reason to withdraw from the Paris Agreement that the, every single other country in the world is in, other than the fact that you know Trump wanted to kind of provoke 
liberals, I guess, take a shot at Obama and signal to the fossil fuel industry that they're going to be able to do whatever they want is the worst kind of uh, political calculation. Now, opinions among American legislators are divided about whether it makes sense for the United States to rejoin the Paris Agreement. You've got a whole range of ideologies here behind opposition to uh, talking about climate change. You have the deniers or the hoaxers or whatever they call them. You have the people that agree that there is climate change, but they don't think man's had as much to do with it as the IPCC or the intergovernmental study suggests. And then there are people that agree that, you know, man has had a role and climate cycles probably have a role too. And we should address what we can. We can't stop climate cycles, but we can deal with man's part. The United States can't preach temperance from a bar stool. We can't tell the rest of the world to do something about climate when we ourselves have pulled out of the Paris Climate Agreement. The American public gets it. The polling shows that there's been a dramatic increase in the acceptance of climate change being real and the need to do something about it. The problem really is in the White House where the president refuses to accept the science and to accept the responsibility of dealing with the consequences of what the science is telling us. For the Earth's lowest lying countries, the problems posed by climate change are more urgent. The largest number of people vulnerable to uh, climate migration is in Bangladesh. It's a very low lying country. There are tens of millions of people who are in real danger of having to move, particularly given the political and ethnic and religious tensions in that part of the world. Whether and how dramatic this is going to be, uh, no one can be absolutely uh, certain. But I think there's some countries, the smaller ones, like some of these South Pacific islands, have actually thought about, well, you know, maybe we have to move quite a bit of our assets to some other part of the world, and there might be a time when our populations would actually have to be transplanted. Several nations in the South Pacific have already chosen to evacuate islands that are facing particularly grave threats. Governments have already relocated entire populations within their national borders. So governments in both the Pacific and the Caribbean have already relocated communities into areas that are safer for them to live. In most of the small island states that are endangered by sea level rise, there is not overt uh, discussion of moving, of fleeing. It tends to be politically unacceptable in those countries. They really want to stay where they've been for thousands of years. As the sea levels rise, low-lying nations face difficult choices about how to prepare. Some countries, like Kiribati, are already making plans to relocate their populations. Kiribati, which is a Pacific country, has already purchased land in Fiji with the idea of relocating its entire population. Dominica, which is a Caribbean island, pledged to become the first climate resilient nation in the world after it was devastated by Hurricane Maria in 2017. And it's planning to take massive infrastructural changes like elevating bridges, burying utility cables. Well, a former administration of Kiribati bought land in Fiji, purportedly for farming, but most people thought also to move some portion of their population. The later administration uh, rejected that idea. But Kiribati is one of the countries that is in most danger of being submerged eventually as a result of climate change. Other countries favor a different approach, using engineering to fight back against rising seas. This approach often requires significant investment. There are two basic strategies to the rising seas. One is protect and the other is retreat. So for example, if you have a very large city, such as New York, extremely valuable, lots of valuable real estate, it would be unthinkable for us to let New York just gradually become inundated. So I think for New York to say, well, let's figure out a way to protect it by seawalls and barriers and the various kinds of mechanisms to do them. We had a tremendous flood in 1953 in the Netherlands that killed over 2,000 people. 
over 30,000 animals, inundated uh, nearly 10% of the entire country. And so you will hear people say, well, you know, the Netherlands has spent over $50 billion since 1953 in order to address North Sea and other flood-related issues. And that's certainly a tremendous amount of money over a 60-plus year period of time. But for the Dutch, it's a matter of national survival. The most disruptive consequence of sea level rise could be the displacement of hundreds of millions of refugees from low-lying areas. Almost no countries have agreed to take in people who are displaced by climate change. There are a few very small bilateral agreements that provide for that. When most people think of islands and the impacts that climate change will have on islands and low-lying nations, they think that these countries will be completely submerged underwater. But long before that happens, many islands will become uninhabitable because of other effects of sea level rise. So for example, sea level rise causes saltwater intrusion, it causes soil salinization, and this affects people's access to fresh water and to food. Local political infrastructures are simply not ready for the very quick tsunami of population migration that comes uh, as the land that they can farm um, changes literally under their feet. Currently, international law does not offer any recognized status to those who are forced to leave their homes on account of climate change. Because we succeeded after World War II in defining a refugee in the 1951 convention. Revising that, opening up the rights of asylum, uh, of refugee status, is going to be a real challenge. The international community has made strides to try to address this problem recently. Almost 200 countries adopted the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And this compact is the first international agreement on migration and recognizes that climate change is a reason that people move and that as a global community, we need to be addressing this issue. The great point that I would make is that in the attempt to try to address those who are forced to flee their country as a result of climate change, we don't end up undermining the position of those who are forced to flee as a result of violence or political conflict. There's quite a debate about whether the definition of refugee should be changed. One grounds for opposition to it is that the number of people who are displaced by climate change would overwhelm the system. It's far more than the number of people who are displaced by what's conventionally thought of as persecution. While vulnerable populations in poorer countries will feel severe impacts from climate change first, advanced economies are not immune to the effects. The United States is probably the most heavily affected by large storms of any large country. Hurricanes are generated by warm water, and they're fed by warm water. As the water gets warmer, uh, then you're likely to have more severe hurricanes, and that means more intense hurricanes. Many advanced economies have coastal communities and cities. New York, for example, is a coastal city. In the U.S., scientists report that over 300,000 homes valued at collectively over $100 billion are at risk of being completely flooded by 2045. I mean, if you pick the same level of protection that the Dutch have, out of necessity, it's $50 billion for every 250 miles of coastline. Another thing we can do is look at some of the resiliency infrastructure ideas that are being talked about, like deep injection wells, berms, seawalls, things like that. They're trying some of that in Miami Beach right now to deal with the rising sea levels. There are calls to look beyond renewable energy sources to address the problem more quickly, as the cost of inaction to global productivity could be daunting. Let's take three degrees C, where the numbers have been pretty carefully gone over at the point where we cross three degree mark. It can cost two to five percent of, of world output and rising very sharply as temperature rises after that. We actually have a form of dense energy that can be made quite safe 
emits virtually nothing and could power an extremely large portion of our society, and that is nuclear fission. The new reactor designs are considered pretty fail-safe. If people fear global warming, but somehow fear nuclear power more, I, I question their seriousness on the issue. There's no mention of something like nuclear power, which is by far the largest source of emissions-free electricity that we have on this planet and can provide a lot of baseload power. And one would think that if you are really worried about the existential threat that climate change could pose, you would want to build all the nuclear you can get. Some experts have argued that the ongoing migration crises in Europe and the Western Hemisphere are opportunities for richer nations to learn how to manage the even larger flows of migrants that climate change might trigger. The influx of migrants that happened in 2015 was a great wake-up call to many of the politicians in the European Union that you may have a good will to be able to bring migrants into a society, but that this needs to be calibrated with regard to thinking about the social security system to be able to support this, the welfare system to be able to support this, as well as the educational and growth opportunities going forward, the convertibility of skills, the retraining of skills. The lessons are not yet being learned. There is an enormous temptation on the part of the richer countries to ignore problems until they are overwhelming. And all of our experience at the International Rescue Committee is that the sooner you address the position of refugees, the sooner you integrate them into society, the greater their chances of success. Think of the strengthening of Orban's government in Hungary. Think of the strengthening of right-wing parties in France. And think, of course, of Brexit. It, all driven heavily by, not just, but heavily by migration concerns. So we've entered a period of political populist pushback against uh, refugees and migrants. And the politics of all of this is very challenging. In the United States, one plan to address climate change has been nicknamed the Green New Deal. The Green New Deal is a set of principles and a resolution. It's not a, not a bill, and it's four basic points when it comes to energy. One is we have a very large problem. Second of all, we have to respond with a very robust solution. Third, we'll create millions of jobs as we rebuild our energy economy. And fourth, we can direct a lot of those jobs to places that really need them, including former fossil fuel communities, to frontline urban communities that have been bypassed before, and to rural and frontier communities. There's some very nice aspirational goals in there, no doubt about it. I don't know that I see it as a uh, structurally complete package of how to get there. That's why I'm focusing on some real tangible things, like the resolution about sea level rise, like the carbon tax, like pushing to ban offshore drilling in the eastern Gulf. We've become the world's leading producer in natural gas uh, and in oil. What the Green New Deal attempts to do is tax and regulate and mandate that affordable, reliable energy out of existence. And that's going to have uh, cataclysmic economic effects on this economy. There are millions of jobs to be had in renewable energy technology and solar panel construction and wind turbine development and advanced battery technology. And if the United States doesn't create a domestic market for those technologies, then those companies are going to continue to grow in places like China and India and Europe, where there are domestic markets for renewable energy. So, you know, I just don't buy this idea that a big investment in renewable energy in this country is expensive. What's expensive is not creating a domestic market for renewable energy. In less developed countries, large-scale development projects to address climate change bring economic challenges. The Green Climate Fund was designed to address this issue. The Green Climate Fund was established by the United Nations as a sort of a bank to take in money from the developed countries that would be used to assist in the climate mitigation and adaptation measures of the developing countries. What we said as a consortium of more advanced economies, the US, Europe, Japan, and others, is we will create a fund that will be available to help poorer countries skip over the dirtier forms of energy like coal and develop clean, renewable sources of energy. One of the things I remember in the very last days of the Obama administration is we just kind of went around knowing that Trump was going to take aim at this. How can we commit as much 
money into this as possible and ended up with kind of several billion dollars as a U.S. commitment. Trump, of course, has walked away from this, pulled back. The fact that uh, the U.S. pledged three billion and only gave one during President Obama's administration was again a step in the right direction, but not adequate. The fact that we've given nothing since that point to this vital fund is a sad commentary on our unwillingness to recognize the global responsibilities that exist to deal with the threat of climate warming. At the heart of the climate change issue is the question of what richer countries owe to the world's most fragile nations. First and foremost, I think we need to continue to promote policies that increase economic growth in the developing world. And part of that is ensuring they have access to affordable, reliable power, because it's when countries have a significant level of income that they start to care about the environment and consequently will care about climate change. My view is that the first step that countries have to take is to raise the price of carbon, raise the price of CO2 emissions. That will solve a lot of the issues that need to be solved. We cannot have our actions create catastrophic conditions for vulnerable people around the world and then turn a blind eye to the impact that we have created and the moral responsibility that we have to reach out our hands to help. I think it's incumbent on countries like our own uh, and others like the Dutch who have studied these problems ad infinitum uh, to share our knowledge and capabilities with the world. How well we can prepare will be a kind of a judgment on us in the human story. We knew, have we gotten prepared how well of a job have we done? We'll see how we do in, uh, in the human story. The gradual rise in sea levels and increasingly severe storms are a crisis in slow motion. Like all mammals, humanity is superbly adapted to deal with immediate threats, but far less capable of tackling long-term challenges. With so much potential to reshape how nations interact with one another, climate change and rising seas may force the world to recognize that the decisions made today will be felt for generations to come. Great Decisions is America's largest discussion Mr. Travis Williams, we'll turn it over to you for um, some commentary on that video. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, one thing I wanted to do before we kind of open up for any kind of discussion is I have uh, something I'm gonna share with you. So I'm gonna share my screen so I can show you a few things. Um, so if you, uh, if you're interested in kind of following some of the more factual details on this topic, I think that's one of the problems. And I shared this the last time I spoke to Hasp on the climate, uh, the climate crisis is that there's a lot of information that gets thrown out there and it gets thrown out there typically in probably what I would say is the most inappropriate way possible. And that's by politicizing it and stacking um, one, one faction of individuals versus another, um, one country against another. And the reality to the climate issue is it's one of these things that all of us have to play a role in. And um, it's kind of a moral responsibility that we have. So if, as human beings, if we're gonna accept our moral obligation as a human and as a, as a resident of, of this planet, then you're kind of obligated to, to try to do the right thing on behalf of the planet. And I, I think probably most people would agree with me on that. Um, so if we can all stand in that space and then start to work off of the same kind of factual information, um, we, can, we can get ourselves in a much better spot to have this kind of a conversation. So if you go 
I'm just going to share this website. You can check it out on your own if you're interested, but climate.gov, which is part of NOAA's, our National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So it's just part of the United States government. Um, it produces this information. For years, data was collected manually. Now it's mostly collected via satellites and other technological advances. But this dashboard piece that's kind of at the bottom of this is just, it's really interesting. And I think it helps back up a lot of what you just heard. So I wanna just share a few of these with you and step through them quick. But if we look at kind of the global temperature, um, so if you look at this graph, you can see it goes all the way back to 1870. And on the right hand axis, it goes, it's 2020. And uh, the average temp is kind of this line through the middle, um, the, the historical average temperature. And then you can see blue is when it dips below that, um, red is when it jumps above it. And um, you know, just factually speaking, we are seeing ourselves in this trend. So if uh, it doesn't, when we talk about warming, global warming or seeing warming, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single part of the globe is warming at the same rate or experiencing the same type of warming going on. Um, it just means that that average temperature across the entire planet is going up. So, so that graph really kind of gives you that information. Um, another one that's really important, you heard a lot in that video about CO2 and whether we should tax it and um, the impact that it's having. So carbon, carbon does a lot of things. Um, one, of, one of the issues that it creates um, is this warming effect in the atmosphere. And if you look at this graph, you can see just, I mean, literally in just the last uh, few years, I believe it's in the last 40 to 50 years, it has, it has skyrocketed. Um, it has gone from you know, what was under, under 300, like 280 parts per billion, and it's jumped all the way to 409 right now. So um, that's just another uh, a graphic. You know, Again, factually, we're seeing that that is going up. And then uh, the other one that I wanted to share is we heard a lot on the rising sea level. So if you click on the bottom here, you can get these different charts. Um, and one of the things that that we're seeing is that they, and they mentioned this, but we're seeing about a three and a half inch rise in sea level over the last, um, what, 30 years. Um, and if you look at this graph, they've got it plotted. They start to show you in the dark blue here when, uh, when they've changed ways that they're measuring it. Um, but it, uh, it's definitely on the increase and uh, we're, seeing, we're seeing communities go underwater. I've had the privilege of being in places um, in the Arctic um, where there's communities that were built on sand spits that go out into the ocean and they're, they're in, their uh, indigenous tribes have lived there for a thousand years um, because they couldn't live in the tundra and other places that was frozen and inhospitable. And now these communities, I've actually, you know, witnessed them. Ben, I've stood on the on the shores where they live, and they're having to move because of that. Um, and so you'll see a lot of this nuisance flooding. I wanted to just share this photo, but that's something that's that we've got a lot of evidence of. And they mentioned it in the video. Um, so the communities, like in uh, Miami and stuff, are seeing these uh, frequent floodings every time the tide rises up higher and higher. Um, I, I'm also going to give you a, a flip to this conversation as we talk about this. Um, this graphic is one that I have torn feelings on when I see this stuff. So, you know, I want to be transparent with you and you, you can easily get that fear mongering going by showing people graphics and saying, well, the glaciers are melting. So that's the evidence. And that's a little bit of a dangerous conversation to have scientifically, because when you look at glacier, um, history. You know, we had an ice age that produced a significant amount of glaciers. In fact, the entire state of Michigan was, was basically covered by glaciers. So I, we have the Great Lakes. Um, those glaciers retreated, and that's part of what we would refer to as more of a climactic cycle. So we do see places like this in Alaska, the Peterson Glacier, where you know, 1917, it was all ice. And then today, 2005, it's not. But if you've ever been to Alaska, you know that most of the uh, inside passage, the, the southeastern Alaska area um, was completely under ice, you know, just a few hundred years ago. So uh, it is changing drastically there. That's not necessarily all driven by climate change. That's not me telling you climate change isn't real. I, am, I believe climate change is, does exist. 
But I think we have to be careful when we start throwing facts and information out there. And so I just wanted to share that as well, kind of on the other side of it. But here's the type of fact that I think is important. When you think of the Greenland ice sheet, which is a significant ice mass, um, from 1992 to 2001, it lost 30, 34 billion tons of ice. And from 2012 to 16, in a five-year period, it lost 247 billion tons of ice. So those are the kind of metrics that I think we got to make sure we're all looking at when we're having these conversations. So you can see data that says that you know the world is getting warmer, that uh, we are seeing an increase in carbon, and uh, we are also seeing you know, the, the reduction in ice in places, we're seeing sea level rising. Um, and that those are facts that we need to stand on as we have these conversations with one another and not just blank, blanket kind of make observations that, well, this changed, therefore this is happening. Because there are gonna be summers that are warmer than others. You're gonna see cold spells and warm spells and that doesn't dispel the, you know, the fact that, that the climate is actually changing. So I'd recommend if you're really interested in data to, to check out climate.gov and kind of click through these dashboards and uh, see what you can you know, kind of learn yourself in there. Um, lots of good information. And again, I would just really highly recommend standing on facts as you're having those conversations. So, um, so I, if you don't know who I am, I uh, am a Hope College graduate and I have lived in this community since graduated from Hope. I have a degree in biology, um, environmental science, and uh, spent best most of my career since leaving Hope working here uh, with the ODC network where I spend more time now uh, running a nonprofit and not using the science necessarily and doing uh, doing the nature thing that I once did, but I do travel quite extensively and uh, I am a member of the strategic development team for the community energy plan for the city of Holland. Um, our organization has a contract with the city of Holland to offer sustainability education. We have someone on staff that manages that for us. And uh, so I, I, I would say I have a, a little knowledge in this area and um, I'd be happy to try to answer questions or we can start to facilitate some conversation on this from here so okay thank you uh if anyone would like to unmute themselves to make a comment or ask a question please feel free to do so i don't have anything in the chat right now so feel free to go ahead Uh, I would say that I thought carbon uh, dioxide is a good thing because that's what trees produce and stuff like that. So when that goes up, why is that a bad thing? Good question. So I mean, it is important. Trees actually will utilize carbon dioxide in their growth, which is very true. And that that is, you know, having a, a certain level of them in the atmosphere is good when it exceeds um, what is, you know, essentially a safe level in the atmosphere is when it becomes a problem. So too much carbon in the atmosphere, when it rains, it, you get this acid rain, as you probably heard of, but you get carbonic acid. And when the, the carbon levels creating carbonic acid in the water falls into the oceans, um, there's huge impacts there because what that does is uh, affects the ability for, um, invertebrate organisms that make shells, like even, uh, you know, different crustaceans, um, coral, uh, it loses its ability to actually create uh, shell matter when, when it has carbonic acid too high in the system. And so it starts to disrupt the entire food web um, when the coral reefs start to die. So if you actually follow in Australia, the Great Barrier Reef, about 50% of it has died over the last, uh, uh, I don't know, it's a couple decades. Um, they've lost 50% of the coral reef, it's dying. And that's been attributed to the warming water levels and the increase in carbonic acid in the system, which comes from carbon. The impact that that has is that if you don't have these reef systems, then you also lose those barrier island uh, or barrier structures that help minimize the effect of you know, storm systems and surges as well as again, it, it disrupts the wildlife. So it has wildlife impacts. And then of course, if you get too much of it in the atmosphere, it, it's a greenhouse gas, which, which basically begins to trap um, the heat inside the earth and it warms the earth. And if the earth warms, 
the oceans are, are the, you know, one of the big factors that the ocean systems that we have um, play for us is that they absorb a lot of that heat, but they only have a certain capacity to absorb heat um, before it starts to go the wrong direction. So there, it, it's not horrible that there's carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but when you move beyond the, what is a, a kind of homeostasis threshold or what is uh, a good threshold of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it starts to create some pretty significant problems. Thank you. Anyone else? I, have, I, was, I was wondering what your opinion is on the carbon tax. Yeah, I, I, I would have to be honest with you and tell you that I, I'm not an economist, so I don't have a really strong opinion on that, but I think it's, it, it may have to play a factor into this if we're going to meet uh, long-term goals. Um, but, you know, right now what you're seeing a lot of is companies are doing, they're buying what's called offsets. Um, so, you know, you'll hear about Google or Microsoft or some major company going carbon neutral or you know, whatever their, their words they're using. And, and quite often what they're doing is buying carbon offsets. So they're, they're actually paying somebody else to, you know, not cut down a forest or to plant more trees or do something that's offsetting the carbon that they're creating. Um, I think the carbon tax idea um, is, is an interesting one, um, but it obviously comes with significant ramifications too. So you can put a carbon tax <laughs> on a community, but you look at like Holland, where a significant amount of our energy consumption here is like the, the biggest amount is taken in by our, uh, by our industrial uh, in the, you know, community. So we have you know, the Haywards, the Gentexes, the Herman Millers, all these great companies that we have that make our community wonderful and invest in our community and provide all these jobs. Um, they're the ones that, that would have to be paying this carbon tax. And so there is a possibility that that has a negative impact, you know, economically, if that has to happen now. And then the flip side of that coin is, but does that drive them to implement more sustainable practices? Um, sure it does, but I, you, you cannot run Hayworth or Gentex or any major company on solar panels. Um, it just, it won't work when there's, when there's a foot of snow that falls over a three day period, um, the output of solar is not going to completely power um, these companies. So it's a, it's, it's something that we have to make some pretty significant decisions on. Do you want the, the economic benefits that we have in a community like ours, or do you want the environmental side? And, and I'm not suggesting you have to pick one or the other, but we have to find that balance in that process. So um, carbon tax probably has a, a role in it in some way, shape or form. Um, but again, I'm not an economist, so I don't want to sit here and try to pretend like I can give you the mathematical ups and downs of that. Thanks, Travis. Linda Winkleman, go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Hi. What about um, that in the pandemic when the whole world went quiet and then we had that big graph where the whole, you know, everything kind of the smog disappeared, all the industries went down. It was it was international. You could see that the heat temperature change. We can't, of course, continue that, but um, is there a location that can, is there a site that continues to monitor that and show us data, what the changes were before, after, and now, before, during, and now after? Is there a location I could go to find more information on that? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know of any location where you can go and find that. I'm sure somebody's marked monitoring Is it like that, a NASA thing? I mean, is it that global? If you dig into those NASA sites, you probably can find more information on that. I, I, you know, there might be more, more stuff than what I just showed you a few minutes ago on that. Um, but it is really true. We saw that same thing happen in 2000 um, and was it 2001 when 9-11 happened and they shut down uh, air traffic for, you know, a week or whatever it was. That the same thing resulted there because stuff shut down and there was less um, pollution going into the air um, so that it's a it's a perfect example of what the impact is um, and you see it in wildlife and everything else you know 
national parks and places that shut down for a while over this year the pandemic. That led to, you know, people having amazing wildlife encounters and the animals started to be more free roaming. Yeah, I saw that. They came out of the, the depths of the woods that they, they normally don't come out of. And I think the, the positive of this is, and I think that's what we all need to understand is, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, the fear mongering side of this. And I, I do believe that sometimes we can get too far to that side um, with how we report on things. Um, and it's not that it's necessarily unjustified always, but what I think is important for us to keep keep in mind is there is a lot of hope out there. It's, this isn't all just doom and gloom because we have evidence of that as you, as you just illustrated. You shut down things for a month and all of a sudden you see significant changes. You know, Mother nature and the environment is pretty resilient. And um, it, it, if we take care of it and are responsible with it, it, it can adjust itself. Do you find it hopeful that um, many major corporations, um, at least in their press releases and what they tell us, that they are um, trying to be good uh, citizens addressing climate change, even um, though the current administration has moved back regulations, for instance, the um, Cal, uh, the automakers saying that they will abide by uh, the California emission control numbers rather than dialing back the way the federal government has said. Do you feel that there are some individual corporate uh, positives in that area? Absolutely. And I would tell you that, um, you know, one of the unique things I get to do is interact with a lot of our lo lo on a local level, a lot of our major corporations. And um, you know, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to this. So if you're a publicly traded company on the market, you know, the voice of the people, the shareholders, goes a long way. And there are a lot of uh, investment companies right now, as well as corporations, that are having to take note that um, investors are are saying that you know we are we do not want to own your stock or we do not want to invest in your company if you're not you know, meeting these environmental standards. And so I think there's, there's, there are triggers, there are levers out there that can be pulled and, and you as an individual help pull those as shareholders and, and companies and so forth. So that's one. Two, um, you know, getting to work with some of these major corporations, they have some pretty significant investments that they make. Um, and are, it's not always public and it's not always something that you and I get to necessarily see. Maybe I do a little more because I get to step inside in some of these, but there are companies um, here locally that are that have pretty strong environmental practices. Herman Miller is a, one of our leading companies in the area with a lot of environmental practices put into place and um, and they're living into it. So I, I believe that as you, um, if you look at Hayworths and the Herman Millers and Gentexes and, um, you know, I'm, I'm driving those three names, but there's a lot of other companies that have pretty strong sustainability records or they're improving on them because they're taking note that that needs to happen. The other thing that we're seeing a lot of too is the recognition that um, you can reduce your long-term you know, costs by uh, changing to more alternative energy portfolios. So as the price of solar and other, other uh, systems comes down, it's allowing some of these companies to transition to that. So um, we have Oh, I'm thinking out loud here. We have about 80, I think, kilowatts roughly of solar panels that are on um, hooked to three, four different buildings on our property, 20 kilowatts each. Um, and it produces around 25% of our electric here at the ODC network within our preschool, our operations buildings, our visitor center, et cetera. And um, by having those those things in place, you know, we're we're actually able to the, the way it works is that we'll actually end up saving over the life, the guaranteed life of those solar panels, we will actually save um, around $40,000 per solar, solar panel connection to a building on our energy bill over a 25 year guaranteed life of the solar panel. And so there's, there's information now coming out that's starting to illustrate to people that, you know, this does work. So if you go to the, the automotive industry, um, the people that installed our solar panels here, they've installed on the tops, the rooftops of um, GM and Ford buildings in Detroit area, you know, just acres and acres and acres of solar panel systems on rooftops. 
Um, so I, I think it is important for us to recognize that although you don't read about that in the paper every day, these companies are making these shifts. Um, a lot of the coal plants and things are coming offline. They're being replaced with alternative sources. Um, and they talked about that in the video as well. And I think as these companies have to make these decisions and make changes, I think you'll see more and more of that happening. But we also have to understand that, again, if Ford, GM, Hayworth, Herman Miller, Gentech, pick any company you want that's large, like they, they, they need energy to end up to do what they're doing. And so we have to make sure that that is being provided to them. There's a, the LG Chem plant here in Holland uh, announced I'm not going to get my numbers exactly right on this, but they're doing like doubling the size of their facility here in Holland. Um, it's going to double the number of jobs that are offered and everything else to make batteries for vehicles and things like that. So all sounds great, but guess what? That's going to come with them needing more energy usage in order to function. So again, trade-offs. Do we want the jobs? Do we want the, the, the energy? Do we want the battery systems? Do we want all that? Then it's going to take some place that LG Chem or some battery company has to exist to, to make those batteries. And that comes with using energy. So the, those balances are really important. I think one thing that, uh, one thing that happens is that these companies who um, are such um, leaders in their own fields of research, whether it's automotive or office furniture or whatever, they are leaders in research and development and they turn those brains, not just to their product, but okay, how can we um, address the, uh, our environmental impact? So they're putting um, great resources, great mental resources um, into solving these problems, even though it's not their core business. Yeah, no, it's very true. And we've benefited from that as an organization here. We have a 72 acre wetland adjacent to Hayworth's corporate headquarters that they donated to us. And we turned it into wetlands for Project Clarity to filter the water in our watershed. You know, they didn't have to do that, they, but they donated that to us. They don made a significant donation to Project Clarity to invest in that. That's a water quality related investment, but again, they do that. And if you look at a lot of these companies, they have zero landfill, you know, their waste is all recycled back out. So I, there are, there are positive things that are happening. It doesn't mean that we're in a great spot or that we need to, we can pause, but um, I think it's just important that we don't think that everything is just absolutely doom and gloom as we walk through this. And I'm a big believer that if we don't have our cup half full, um, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to make progress go. So I, I just, am a, I'm an optimist and I want to believe that if we all band together and do good things, we can make, we can make a positive impact happen here. Do you have I, knowledge of any data that's been taken down from climate.gov in recent years and months? Taken down, removed? Yes. I, I don't, I do not, no. So good, thank you. Yep. I have a question. Um, along with uh, changes in climate, there's also been an increase in uh, extinction of various species. Can you speak to that, please? Yeah, so there's a varying studies that come out. Um, you know, these are, these studies typically are using, you know, assumptive models based on, on data collection, but uh, with the climactic changes, what we're seeing worldwide is uh, the, there's an estimate that's uh, around 40% of our uh, wildlife populations have declined um, and growing towards 60% um, is their projected targets that they're heading to over the next decade even. And a big part of that is, again, as I mentioned earlier, when the question that was asked about, you know, is carbon bad, good, whatever. As these, as the sea levels warm, and just a couple degrees is all it takes, and you got to understand the other chemical interactions that happen. So then you get these increases in carbonic acid, you get a more acidic, acidic water system. Um, you begin to see die-offs in organisms, and that obviously affects then the food chain and the food web. Um, when you start removing crustaceans from the ocean or plankton species that uh, uh, are major food sources for animals, you begin to see this pretty massive decline in species. 
We also are seeing that true in a lot of insect species as well as birds, um, just because the habitats are being altered. Um, so as we see habitats altered, like in the rainforest, for example, well, not just the rainforest, but in the Andes Mountains in South America, um, there are species of birds that they've monitored that were always found at say a thousand meter elevation. And now those birds are being found at 1100 meter elevation or 1500 meter elevation. They're having to move because the climate is changing in a way that is causing the plant species or the habitat to move. And as these shifts happen, you start to see species impact happen. Um, in that case, it might not be necessarily killing the organism, organism off, but it is causing them to have to adjust where they live. When you see that have to happen to something like a polar bear or a walrus or uh, uh, you know, caribou, reindeer, different organizations that live in the, in the extremes, um, polar extremes, they don't have any place necessarily to move to. Um, and what's happening, I know in the Arctic right now, concerns are growing is species like polar bears that primarily eat seals and they rely on sea ice in order to catch the seals. Um, without having the same levels of sea ice, they cannot hunt as effectively. And what that's causing them to do is now start to move into some of the um, indigenous communities and, and communities that are in and around those Arctic regions. And now you're having the human and bear interaction, which is dangerous, poses a threat to human life. And when those situations exist, um, usually the organ, the lesser organism, in this case, they would, the polar bear would lose out because humans are gonna protect humans over polar bears and that's what happens. And so we see that, we see that with overfishing, we see that in just a lot of different ways going on right now. Salmon in Alaska is a significant issue. Warming of the streams um, is starting to cause some pretty big problems as well. So you're seeing less and less uh, salmon, then that affects bears, it affects orcas, it affects, you know, organisms up and down the food chain. Thank you, and Travis. I have a question thing. that came in the chat um, that says, realizing that the need for change is a given, what is something that you would recommend each person do to stretch our collective comfort zone and support the actions of corporations? Yeah, so I think, you know, I think what needs to really be done is uh, as, as people, we, we have things that we can do, simple things. So I'll start with some little things, but, um, you know, even down as simple as planting a tree, uh, that, that has significant benefit. It can have significant benefit. Planting multiple trees has even more benefit. So, you know, you can take individualized action that way. If you have property and have the ability to plant a tree or fund trees to be planted somewhere else in the community, you know those are things that you can do. Um, when it, when you look at the the greater level of like corporate action or um, how how you can help impact a, on a much larger scale, if you want to look at it that way, um, how you invest your resources. So again, don't. Uh, don't underestimate the value of actually how you invest with shit, you know, in, in terms of stock market shareholder and organizations. Um, the, there's a very strong push right now for um, people to only be investing in companies that are, are you know, taking the climate crisis serious and, and are working with strong environmental intentions. And so your choices can definitely help drive that forward. And I think you see that in, in little pockets of, of action happening. Um, in our community here locally, it, you have organizations like ours um, and there's others, it's not just us, uh, the Mactel Watershed Project and um, the Ottawa County Park System. There's other organizations around that um, are investing in our environment on a daily basis. And I think that you know your ability to involve you know, get involved with those organizations and support their work um, does help advance uh, this as well. So, um, but I, I think that, you know, when it comes to research, when it comes to like how you can get involved, it's really about looking at the things that you have, you know, a tight connection to. So if you're a property owner, what can you do on your property? Um, if you're a business owner, what can you do with your business? Um, and then how you invest your money and how you make your decisions, even down to who you shop with. Um, that's been a real, real positive thing, you know, when you're 
buying clothing from clothers that have environmental policies. Patagonia is a really good one, for example. Um, you know, they, they, they take a strong stance on the environment with what they do and, and the products that they use. So um, your choices can have a strong impact on the environment. Is, is there any type of timeline for a point of no return? There, there are those that have been produced. Um, I can't speak with them with any like amazing knowledge that I can share with you on that. So I wanna be careful. Um, they, so there's the, like the Paraclimus climate agreement um, suggested that they had to stay below the two degrees centigrade change you know, global change in temperature. Um, and I've heard three degrees is kind of like, if it gets to that, that's gonna be catastrophic. So I think, you know, and we're teetering at like one and a half at this point. So we're, we're close as it stands and we have to, as an organ, as a, as a community, as a world, we have to start putting these things into place so we can, we can see those changes. Now, having said that, one of the things that I, I think we have to understand is that there's, it's such a complex system um, and there are, are a lot of levers being pulled right now in a lot of different ways. So, you know, is there a date and time? That's when I hear people say, if we don't do this by 2050, we're all done. I'm not sure if that's, I, I mean, that's great that someone's picked that date. I don't, I don't know if you could say that that is the date. I think that they're trying to take the best guess with the information that they have in front of them. Um, but if we continue to make progress as a world in the right direction, obviously we can, that date's gonna shift. Um, and I do believe that, that positive things are happening. There's a group, 14 countries um, right now have signed on to a volunteer agreement. They're coastal company, or coastal countries. And they are working to address the whole rising seas and climate change piece. Um, and they've just band together to start to make change. And one of the big things they're looking at is, um, if you're familiar with mangroves or seagrass fields, that's one of the, they have like a four times greater ability to sequester carbon than a regular tree, a mangrove uh, does. And so by investing more in our coastal lines and the countries that have a lot of coastal habitat, that, that's one of the things that you could, you know, we can see a significant change very quickly. So to get to your question, I don't know if there's a date. I mean, that people throw dates out there. I've heard different dates. They say it's by 2050, it's by 2040. Um, I don't have enough knowledge to tell you that one of those is truly the hard line date. I think that the point being made is, is that we have the next decade or two to really reverse this, or it is gonna be catastrophic to the next generation. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, related to what we were talking about a few minutes ago, do you know if there's an easy place to access a list of corporations that are taking climate change seriously and that we can invest in? I know that like, you know, Unilever and Tesla and Patagonia are on that list, but do you know of a spot where there's a kind of top I, 50 or something? I don't have something I can give you directly right now. Um, I'm sure a little Googling, we could find something. Um, I, but I, can I can tell you that there's uh, a number of mutual funds out there, investment companies that you yeah. can invest in, that yep. their whole mission is finding companies that um, uh, are, are, you know, take this seriously and, and they may measure and analyze those companies and invest in them. So there's ways to do that. And you can talk to a, a broker or other investment advisor or do your own, like say Google research and find out what, what those, those um, investment funds are. Oh yes, and, and you can go to morningstar.com. Morningstar.com is heavily into ESG investing, yeah. lots, lots of columns. One of the, so there's a, I believe it's Blackwater is one of the largest investment companies or is the largest investment company in the world. And they announced earlier, it might've been this year that they announced that they will no longer, and uh, you know, share, you know, sell shares or, or interact with the companies that do not have um, uh, a, a climate plan and, a, and an environmental uh, focus in their corporate portfolio. So, 
you know, it's, there's people that are, uh, that that's the kind of stuff that's going to really get changed, right? Because if all of a sudden the biggest investing companies in the world are saying, well, we aren't going to invest with you unless you're doing, you know, environmentally appropriate activity, then that's going to, that's what really wakes people up and changes things. Um, so. There's a comment that um, one of our members really enjoyed Climate Justice, the book by Mary Robinson. And she's asking if you have a current favorite book on climate. I don't really have a favorite one on climate. I'll be honest, I haven't read like a ton of books on climate itself. So I, I got to be honest about that. I read a lot of science journals and things like that. So that's more where I get my information from. Okay, and then I have another question, kind of a long one here. How can we deal with both research and new developments that have been financed by corporate interest where before the new products can be implemented, the research is bought up and either shelved or taken away by patents. Solar research and development is a prime example, along with other energy developments. Yeah, I, I don't know if I have a good answer to that question. Um, you know, maybe somebody else has something they'd like to, to share on that. I, 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 it clearly happens, stuff happens all the time like that. I think that there's the resiliency of, of really good quality products and opportunity out there keeps driving it. Like right now, solar is, um, is a hot thing and it is the part, the price of it has come down and the demand has gone way up. And, um, you know, it, it certainly has people that are out against it because it obviously goes against the fossil fuel and industry and so forth. So it, I think that's just an ongoing thing. And that's part of us, you know, as humans and as, uh, people who are working and, buying products and, and, and existing in our, in our world, we have to be able to filter that a little bit and continue to invest our resources in what we know is best. So. Great, thank you. All right, I don't have anything else in the chat. So if anyone else wants to pipe in with a question or comment, otherwise we will wrap up in a moment here. Uh, Citizens Climate Lobby tonight, 6.30, is having a presentation by a financial advisor mm. regarding investing in environmentally sound companies and organizations. That's Citizens Climate Lobby tonight at 6.30 on, on Zoom. Thank you, Bill. That's great. There is a uh, country, and I think it's Scandinavia, maybe Iceland or one of those, that has devised a method of sequestering CO2 in rock. And it's a permanent process where it is mixed with the rock and chemically becomes a part of it, I guess. And it sounds like a very good way to sequester CO2 for forever. They say forever. Uh, between that and a plan to stop using the existing sequestered CO2 such as, or C, such as the coal and oil and gas, are the two ways that, that to me seem like the only ways to get to a stable CO2 situation. I think, I think there's a ton of merit in what you just said. I, I would add to that though, that uh, one of the greatest things that we could do that we do control um, and it, it, it obviously, this is not an easy thing. There, this is complicated, but um, preservation of, of forest, rainforest and land uh, also can have a significant impact on that. One of the negatives that's going on right now is we are clear cutting rainforests um, around the globe um, which is one of our primary ways that we've been dealing with sequestering that, you know, and it's been our big lung filter for our, for our world. And we have to stop doing that and we have to start finding ways to preserve and protect that. So the more we can create these protected areas on the planet as well um, is, is critical. And you heard that a little bit in the video when I talk about like, you know, the United States is a industrially developed country and we we've been for, a few hundred years at you know aggressively developing our country and, and not necessarily all of it but in a lot of places to for financial gain and for just you know our our whole civilization's growth and gain now these other countries are starting to do it brazil other places 
but they're clear cutting the rainforest to do it. And, you know, we're all yelling, stop, you can't do that. And that, that's a, that's a conundrum for them because they're like, well, you guys cut stuff down and, you know, built society. And now you're telling us we can't. And I think we have to figure out a way to support that from a global um, perspective and understand that uh, there's, that it, that it's going to have a give and a take to it. And that's, that's something that's going to be tricky to work out, but uh, there was a study produced um, and I can't remember where it came from now. I used it in my presentation I did for half, half the other uh, few months back, but that showed that there are, they've actually, scientists have identified several key locations around the globe that if we were to stop and reverse um, the, the deforestation and removal of it and preserve it, that it itself could have a, you know, one of the most significant impacts on long-term climate change. But, but Travis, why are they cutting down the rainforest? Uh, on an individual level, if we could reduce the amount of beef that we were eating, then they would reduce the amount of rainforest that they cut down to raise beef. There's no doubt about it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's there. They are, they are, I've spent many, many different trips in Ecuador and it's oil is a major, a major export for Ecuador and they clear cut parts of the rainforest to get to the oil. And, you know, in Brazil, it's, it's farming, it's agriculture, it's grazing. I mean, there's so many different aspects to this that, uh, that cause it. And, and it's our own human behavior that leads to it without question. Um, it, a number of years ago, and I didn't pay attention at the time, but in Holland, there was a, harb a carbon sequestering project going on. And then I think Holland City decided not to do that and to go ahead and build our new plant and, and utilize natural gas. Why? And I didn't fully understand just from the reports, because I didn't go to the meetings or anything. Why was that um, idea of sequestering carbon in the limestone, et cetera, or was there not limestone there, um, beneath uh, Holland City? Yeah, I don't I don't know a lot about that. I remember if I remember my memory recalls and some of the things I've heard about it was just the cost, uh, cost effectiveness of it was, it was just so much more that they, they didn't go down that road. I believe that's what it was, but. What was the idea to sequester um, carbon in limestones? Was that part uh, I, of it I or think, not? I think Am I wrong? Well, I don't, I don't have a good answer. I don't want to try to answer it because I'm not exactly sure what it was. I, I think they looked at sequestering as one of the options in the grand energy plan. Um, but it, it was not something that they could, you know, was financially feasible or determined that at the time. So. Okay, thank you. The, uh, the, the, the uh, country that is uh, sequestering or studying sequestering in this special stone, uh, it was a specific kind of stone. It wasn't limestone and it was touted as a permanent process. So limestone may not be permanent. But also, uh, there's another form of energy which you don't hear much about, and that is fusion. Uh, it seems to me with this climate problem that there should be a lot of investment going on with fusion as a potential means of providing energy. Uh, I don't know why that is. I think it's mostly that people don't want it in their backyard. That's right or wrong. That's the response that you get. I, I would agree with you that there's some pretty significant opportunity there, but. Well, this is different than fission. Uh, it's fusion. It produces water or something similar, some benign thing. Uh, and it's the same kind of process that fuels the sun. Uh, and it's Hard to do, that's why it's not been done yet, but progress is being made and it seems like with perhaps more investment, more progress could be made. Thanks, Tom. To what extent does uh, the rising water, climate change affect the rising waters on Lake Michigan? Well, the rising waters largely on Lake Michigan are driven, I mean, so if we have a wetter climate, if our climate gets more wet, that obviously has an impact. 
Um, most of the rising water levels on of the Great Lakes are driven by the upper Great Lake Basin stuff. So it's um, it's what goes on in Lake Superior that affects what goes on in Lake Michigan and Lake Huron because it drains down. Um, so a lot of our, um, whether we have ice on the lake and how much evaporation occurs, how much snow, ice, rain uh, occurs in the north and then flows down. Um, and then also here, you know, it's, it's certainly uh, rainfall here locally or snow melt here locally draining into the lake all has an impact on that. But it's multiple factors. So it's ice cover. And when the, when the lake is not frozen all winter long and you have a significant amount of wind, you actually get a really significant amount of evaporation. Um, and then, uh, and, and so ice has a major component to it, ice cover on the Great Lakes. And then again, you got to look at what's happening. It's more of on a regional basis, the basin basis. Mm -hmm. So um, we're, we're kind of a lower you know, we're, we're the so Lake Superior drains down into Lake Michigan and Lake Huron and then out from there. So, yeah, that last, has year, an impact. last year, the lake didn't freeze over and our waters froze. <laughs> yeah, but uh, we also have had the wettest years uh, on record. So I think it was two years ago we monitored this for Project Clarity. We had the the wettest, the wettest year in I believe it's 50 years happened two years ago, 2018. Last year was a pretty wet year. It was in the top, it was in the top two or three of the last 50 years as well. So those, those things have impact as well. But again, um, you, it also, if you have significant snow, ice, water runoff coming from the upper basin, it fills the lower basin. So that does impact us as well. And it cycles. So when we have really really, really heavy winters and you get more runoff and you have more water. We've had years where the lake doesn't freeze over at all as well. And, and then you don't have the water rise as much. It's complex. It's not just one thing. It's not, it rained and therefore we have more water. I guess that'd be the, the message there. Okay. Well, Travis, I want to thank you for being with us today again, twice in this semester. We appreciate it. We appreciate your insight and knowledge and certainly your commitment to Holland and our greater community and all of these efforts. So thank you so much. Love everyone. Let's give Travis a Zoom <laughs> hand here. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you Hope for you having me. Yeah. I hope you all have a good afternoon. I'm sure we'll see some of you this afternoon for the elections review class. I'm sure that will be a biggie as well. So we'll see some of you at one o'clock. Thanks. <laughs>